o'clock, so uh, we'll go ahead and uh, get started this morning. Uh, this is uh, a real privilege to be here um, and uh, to be preaching to people again. Um, and not that it wasn't happening on, online, I get that, and we're still online, so, um, and that's a unique opportunity that I'm happy to be able to have, that we all are, Justin and myself. And um, So I want to thank you guys for being here. It's been, it's been it's great to look out and see your faces uh, for several months now. The only face that I've been able to see is Stevens um, as I preach. And uh, as beautiful as this face is, uh, I love to see everyone else. So I'm glad that everyone is here. Um, <clears throat> and this is, I'm just really excited. I'm excited to be back. I'm excited to be uh, preaching here the Word of God in a way that we haven't been able to do for so long. And uh, I know Justin was just as excited And we're so happy to be able to share with you guys. So that's a little bit of introduction, but let's go ahead and just get started in what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, We're going to be talking about Psalm 32. We're going to be talking about what I have titled the cover-up. And we're going to talk about what that looks like, what that means, uh, what that title means, and also what Psalm 32 can teach us today. Before we do, would you join me as we open in prayer? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity today that you've given us. I thank you for your love and grace and mercy that you provided an opportunity to be together in this way. We know that the world is spiraling in so many different directions, and yet, Lord, we know that our refuge, our rock, our fortress, our hiding place is you. And so today, as we come to your word, I pray that we would find peace and solace and hope in your word. I also pray today, Lord, that you would use your word to penetrate our hearts in a way that makes us to just want to be more and more like you, to change our hearts, to be that blessed person that we've been talking about, to be the righteous one that we've been talking about, to look to you in our lives, to run away from sin and to run to you wherever we may face. Help us to do that today as we continue to look at your word. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are going to be in Psalm 32. So if you've already turned there, we've already read it this morning. Uh, and hopefully over the last couple days, maybe you've read it a few times. Uh, there's a, there's, it's only uh, 11 verses, but there's a lot to get to. We're going to try to get through this and look at what God has to say to us as David writes this psalm and what it means uh, for us today to take some stuff out of this. And I think there's some important things that we will see as we look at Psalm 32. But so far, just a little bit of background, if you've been joining us, many of you have. You know that we started a series, Summer in the Psalms, not too long ago. We looked at Psalm 1, Psalm 2, and then uh, Justin looked at three psalms, I think it was 110, 111, 112, over the last three weeks. Uh, And uh, one of the things and the themes that has come out so far as we've looked at the book of Psalms uh, is that a blessed person fears Yahweh. A blessed person, remember blessed, congratulated, uh, some translations say joyful or happy. It's the idea of being fulfilled uh, in the best way you possibly can be. Uh, And... If we want to be a blessed person, we want to be a blessed person, one who is happy, joyful, congratulated, then we will fear the Lord, that we will fear Yahweh. And last week, I caught this, and I wrote it down as soon as I heard it as Pastor Justin was preaching, uh, when he said, what does it mean to fear God? What does it mean to really fear Yahweh? And he said this, uh, the fear of Yahweh is running from sin and running to God. And I thought that was such a simple uh, definition, but it's perfectly amazing. It's, the, it's, a, it's a great uh, summary statement, what it means to fear the Lord, to run away from sin and to run towards God. And that is what fear of the Lord is really all about. Now, as we come to 32, as we come to this chapter, uh, we're actually going to look at that first part of what it means to fear the Lord. And we'll also talk about the second part, obviously, but we're going to kind of focus in on this idea that uh, blessedness means that we run from sin. And we're going to talk about that in Psalm 32 as we look at David's journey, what David does when he thinks about the sin in his life. Uh, and the theme of blessedness does continue here in Psalm 32, in verse 1. And let's just see what that says. We'll read the whole thing in a moment. But it says, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is covered. So in, in chapter 32, in this psalm, we see that there is blessedness to be had, there's congratulations and joyfulness to be had, and that is found in forgiveness of sin. Uh, and we're going to talk about that 
today. So this is this theme has continued to be developed. Now there is one interesting thing about this that we would have we kind of missed because we've been jumping around the Psalms. The last time that this idea of blessedness has been talked about in the chronology of all the different psalms that are written here is actually all the way back to Psalm 1. Uh, Interesting, in Psalm 1 we read about being a blessed person and what that looks like. And then there's been 30, uh, 30 chapters in between, 31 chapters in between, where we haven't really talked about it, but now at 32 it picks it back up, picks the theme back up. In Psalm 1 we looked at the fact that blessedness, and I'm just kind of putting this in a nutshell, boiling it down. Blessedness comes through obedience. It comes through following God. It comes through the fear of the Lord. It comes through obedience. Now, it's interesting as we enter Psalm 32 that blessedness comes not as a result of obedience necessarily, although that's part of it, but blessedness comes as a result of being forgiven. In other words, where blessedness came in Psalm 1 was when we, uh, when we, uh, are successful in obedience, if you want to say it that way. But blessedness comes to the person who also fails miserably and yet finds forgiveness. Because, again, it's not based on our doing and our works, but all based upon God's work in our lives. And so that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at the idea that we can be congratulated and joyful if we are the ones who whose transgression and sin and iniquity has been forgiven. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. And so one of the, the theme that I really want to think about is this. Today we will see that the blessed person deals with their sin appropriately. Now that's an important word there, appropriately, and we'll talk about that in just a little while. So if you want to be congratulated and happy and fulfilled in life, then you will deal with your sin appropriately. But let's look at Psalm 32 and see what it's going to show us. So let's read the whole thing, and then we'll go back and make a, a summary statement, and then we'll break it down. Uh, it's Psalm 32. Uh, blessed are the forgiven, a mascal of David. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away though, though through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as, as by the heat of the summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like the horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with a bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. We're going to see some uh, blessedness here as we talk about Psalm 32. Here's the main point that I want us to understand, and this is where this title, The Cover-Up, comes from. Um, I'm going to say the main point that I get out of this, and you can probably get more than this, but this is what I'm going to focus on this morning. Don't cover up your sin. Let God cover it. Don't cover up your sin. Let God cover it. Uh, hopefully that phrase might resonate in your mind as you think about how you would deal with sin appropriate in your, appropriately in your life. Don't cover up your sin, but instead let God cover it. And let's talk about that for a little bit. But the idea of covering things up is something that we're pretty familiar with. Um, you know, we know all throughout history, we look at uh, government cover, cover-ups and different type of things where things are bad, but somebody doesn't want to show that, so they cover it up in some way. Usually it involves lying, it involves misdirection, and we don't want people to see things, so we might cover it up. Uh, we see this even in physical ways. Uh, a lot of us... Um, Specifically women, uh, it, you know, you use makeup a lot. And a lot of times for makeup, it's to cover something up. Actually, one of the products you might use, I believe, from what I talked to my wife about, uh, is cover up, right? You cover up blemishes. Um, and we do that because we don't necessarily want everyone to see our blemishes. Um, and so we even do that, uh, in a physical way. Uh, one of my favorite ways to cover things up is when you have car trouble. You have car trouble and you hear this weird noise somewhere in the vehicle. And so you're like, okay, something's wrong with my car. I don't really want to deal with it. I don't have time to go to the garage, and I don't have the money to pay for a repair. So I'm just going to turn up the, 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 uh, the radio, right? I'm just going to turn it up loud enough. 
I'll he- all I'll hear is the radio. I won't hear the squealing. I won't hear the banging. And it'll just make it so I won't notice it anymore. We cover up the problem. What really needs to happen is we need to take that car into the shop and get it fixed, but we just decide to cover it up. Personal illustration of this, and this is kind of embarrassing, but why not share embarrassing stories? So um, about a year ago, maybe a little longer, uh, I was... I was trimming my eyebrows, which is weird, right? But sometimes they get a little crazy. Uh, And I had the setting wrong, and I ended up shaving off half of my eyebrow. Um, This was several weeks. I preached. uh, I talked to many people. I don't even, only a few people that were really close to me knew. And how did I cover that up? Well, my wife bought me this amazing thing called an eyebrow pencil. And so... uh, (laughs) I drew in my eyebrow for about a month, and uh, uh, crazy how well they work. But anyway, uh, we, we all have ways of covering things up, though. Uh, even if we want to get even more serious, sometimes with our, with our like, if we're not feeling well, um, and uh, we know that there's something wrong with our body, but we choose just to take pain pills and say, okay, it's going to feel better, so therefore it's not a problem anymore. No, the truth is you need to go to the doctor and figure out what's going on so that you can actually get it fixed. That is kind of what we're going to talk about when we talk about sin. See, I think a lot of us do the same thing with our sin. We don't want people to see our sin. We don't even want God to see our sin. And at times, we don't even want to see our own sin. And so we will do whatever it takes to cover it up. Uh, maybe we turn up the volume in life. You know, we get busy or we just start putting ourselves into something that just consumes us so that we don't think about the sin that we're struggling with. Uh, maybe we just... Uh, draw back from others so that other people won't see our struggle and our sin. Uh, and so, and maybe we, we come up with different ways of, of self-medicating the problem, whatever that might be. Uh, maybe it's through an addiction of some sort, or, or maybe it's just simply, like I said earlier, just finding a hobby. Uh, we can do all these things, and the hope is that we'll cover things up. And I, and I think the thing about it is a lot of times, like I just said, it's not only just to cover it up from other people, you know, that's kind of natural. We don't, we want people to see the best side of us. And so we, we tend to back, a, back away and not want people to see what's kind of not so great about us, the sin that we're struggling with. I think that's really dangerous. We'll talk about that later, but I mean, James, we looked, looked at that. We need to confess our sins one to another. A lot of times we think that we can hide our sin from God, which by the way, just, I mean, this is obvious. I don't think I need to go to chapter and verse on this. God knows what's going on and you can't hide anything from him. Uh, he is, uh, omniscient. He knows all things. And so that is just a fruitless labor. But so many of us try to do that. You know, maybe we stop talking to God or we just think that God doesn't really care as much as we know he does. But I would say even one of the most dangerous things we do is we lie to ourselves. We deceive ourselves into thinking that somehow I'm not struggling. And sometimes that means we look at other people and say, well, okay, you know, my car might be making a weird noise, but their car is uh, all rusted out. It's kind of what we do. Like, okay, I have some problems, but man, at least I'm not that person. We can do that. Or we can just ignore it and, and just justify ourselves. Well, this isn't really that bad. Uh, this isn't a big deal. Everyone does it. There's lots of things we can do. I'm not going to talk all day today about how we cover things up. I think it's fair to say that we do. And David did. And that's what we're going to talk about. So that going back to that main theme, don't cover up your sin in that way. Don't cover it up and hide it from others and hide, try to hide it from God and hide it from yourself. But be honest with yourself and uncover that so that God can cover it. And that's what we'll talk about. And let's get some specifics as we look at that. Uh, so in verses 1 and 2, I want to talk about the promise that is given in this passage. We're going to look at the promise. We're going to look at the process and what confession, uh, how the process comes to get to the point where we're forgiven. And finally, we're going to look at the product, what happens after we experience forgiveness. And so we're going to look at those three things. Interestingly enough, as we've been going through the Psalms, you will see that all all of these practically are poems. And Justin's done a great job as he's talked about how there's different types of poetry that we might not even understand. But today's poetry, I think we can understand because David is going to use parallelism. He's going to compare three things to three things, and, and, and I tried to even keep the notes to everything three, you know, so we can just think of the number three. Uh, so we're going to start in, in verse uh, one and two, looking at the forgiveness or the promise of forgiveness. The, that blessedness comes through, first of all, the forgiveness of transgression. It said, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven. 
Now, if you've been following our devotions throughout the week, there's been a few things that I've shared from a, a website called the, uh, the Bible Project, and they talked about these different words that we have for sin. And the first one is transgression. And so what we see is that blessedness comes through forgiveness of our transgressions. Forgiveness of transgression. What does that mean? Well, I'm not going to go into all the details about transgression and give you all the, 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 uh, the language nuances and everything else. But suffice it to say, when we're talking about transgression, it's about rebellion. It's about rebelling against God. And if you watch some of those videos that we shared earlier, uh, and there's, they actually are linked on our YouTube page. You can check those out if you haven't yet. But transgression, it'll go into a much more detail, but I'm just going to sum it up as saying it's rebellion. It's a breaking of relational trust. When David writes this and he says that blessed is the person who receives forgiveness of transgression, he's saying blessed is the person who receives forgiveness of a rebellion against God, a breaking of a relationship. It's a breach of trust. That's what we're getting at here. See, so many times we talk about sin and we just think about actions, right? We think about what should I do, what shouldn't I do? And if I do the thing I shouldn't do, that's sin. But if I, do, I don't do the thing I should do, that's sin. But we just get it so focused on action and what the specific things we do. But this is getting at the heart of what really hurts, and that is that we rebel against God, that our hearts can rebel against him and break the relationship that we have with him. Isn't that what happened with Adam and Eve? Think about it. They sinned by eating the fruit, but the problem wasn't that they ate fruit. The problem was is that they didn't trust God and they broke the relationship with him. And so the first thing that David says is we, we experience forgiveness of transgression. That is what a blessed man will experience. Now, forgiveness. What does forgiveness mean? Um, and we all think we kind of have an idea of that. And I think forgiveness we do understand fairly well. Uh, but really it means to release or to carry away. To release or to carry away. So we forgive someone that when they hurt us. Uh, it's not just a word that we say. It's not just acting like everything's okay. But it's actually releasing that person and saying, I'm no longer holding any grudge or any type of bitterness towards you. And it's almost as if the sin that they committed against us is carried away. In the Old Testament, we see that happen when the sin of the people of Israel is put on a goat and the goat is sent away. It's the idea that the sin, that the rebellion here, the rebellion that we've committed is forgiven. It's carried away. The relationship can be restored. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So the next thing that David says, is we look at these couplets of three things, the parallelism. He talks about the forgiveness of transgression and then he goes on and talks about covered sin. He said, blessed is the man against, or I'm sorry, tr- whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. This word covered, and this kind of goes back to our theme today. God covers sin. Uh, what does that mean? Well, first of all, let's talk about sin. Uh, so sin is, its most basic form, missing the mark. Uh, again, sin isn't so much about the specific things we do and don't do, but sin is about not fulfilling what we are meant to fulfill. It's missing the mark. It's missing God's uh, will. It's missing uh, doing what God has asked us to do. It's, It's failure. It's failure to do what we know we should do. It's deeper than just action. It's this deep failure that we have, and and David is feeling this. By the way, I didn't mention this, and I was going to, but a lot of commentators think that this was written um, after uh, Psalm 51, uh, which is when David uh, fell to sin with Bathsheba. We know that story. He he committed adultery. He had her husband killed. Um, and then in 51, he, he talks about how he's repenting of that. Um, other commentators say that might that's we don't really have any proof of that. So maybe this is because of that sin, or maybe it's because of another sin, or maybe it's just because of sin in general in his life. I tend to think maybe the third one might be true, as David is reflecting upon his life and thinking about the forgiveness of sin that he can experience. So he's, he missed the mark. David says he's missed the mark. He's failed. We've done the same thing. So what does it mean for God to cover that, that failure? Well, to cover here, this word is talking about to hide or forget our record of wrongdoing. It's to hide a record. You know, we've done wrong. We've failed time and time and time again. And our failure is complete. But we're told that God can cover that. It's the idea of hiding. But whereas we hide our sin from... He, we, in, in the differences, and we'll see in a minute when David calls God his hiding place, that the difference is, is where God will hide our sin, it's he's putting it away, it's no longer seen, it's the record is gone. He has hidden the record of our sin. He has hidden the record of our failures. 
And that is a blessing, right? That is the blessedness that we receive, the congratulations, the, the, the joyfulness that we receive. Then we see that the last double word here we see, and the last thing of this parallelism is, he says, blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. So now we have this third word for sin. So we'd have transgression that means rebellion. We've had sin, which means missing the mark. And now we have iniquity, which really just means crookedness. It's about, it's about the bent of who we are. It, it shows that we're not naturally straight. We're crooked, perverted. We, we tend to take things the way they should be, and we just take them a little off to the left or the right. It's crooked. And it also talks about distortion. We have distorted what is good to twist it to make it into things that good things into things that aren't good any longer because we twist and we distort and it's about crookedness and it goes to the idea again it, it connects us to punishment it connects us to the idea that this type of sin as we talk about iniquity needs to be dealt with and punished we need to be straightened it's like if you go to the chiropractor and you're all twisted up what do you need to happen you need to be straightened And that's what we all need because we are all crooked. And that's what David is getting at. And so to cover uh, that, to and then to count. So then we have this idea of uncounted. Our iniquity is uncounted. What does that mean? Uh, It says here, uh, blessed is the man whom the Lord counts no iniquity. So there's kind of a weird way to make a word out of this, but uncounted iniquity. Um, So if iniquity is crookedness, uncounted is dismissing a debt. It's dismissing a debt. It's when you owe so much because you are so poor. So we think about it and we put crookedness with it. It's like we are so crooked that we can't do anything about it. We can't make things straight. And our debt is needing to be paid. Our debt is needing to be paid. Punishment needs to come to the sin that has destroyed us, to the iniquity that is in our hearts. And we're told that when we experience forgiveness, when we come to God and when he gives this, he counts no iniquity. This is a blessing to us that he cancels our debt. And he says, you know, you have done so many wrong things, right? You've failed. You've been crooked. You haven't been living a straight life. You've been crooked in this, in this way. And, but all of that goes away because I am willing to dismiss your debt. Even though you owe a punishment, I will take it from you. So this is the first couple verses, and I spent a lot of time here because I think this is kind of the theme of this passage, and we're going to see some different pieces that come into it here as we go through the rest of Psalm 32. Uh, but we need to realize that blessedness doesn't come from us covering our sin and trying to make it out to be that we are not as bad as we think we are or that others might think we are, that we try to cover it from God and say, God, I'm not really that bad, or say to ourselves, I'm really not doing anything wrong. I'm really not sinning. We all are rebels. We all have missed the mark. And we all are crooked. We've got to come to that place. If we don't understand that, then we don't understand our need for salvation. And if we don't understand how completely... By the way, as we look at these three words for sin, the idea here is David is saying, I am completely sinful, completely broken. Let's use that word. We're completely broken. But then the three words are forgiveness, both the forgiveness, the uncovering and the covered. It all gets us, or the uncounted and the covering, it all gets us back to, not, if our sin has completely destroyed us, if our sin is completely a thing that is bothering us, God's forgiveness is also complete. It's not partial. You know, I think a lot of us think, again, going back to what I said, I'm not as bad of a sinner as someone else. Truth is, we are all all rebels, we've all failed, and we're all crooked, and we need God's forgiveness. And when we do receive the forgiveness and the covering and the, uh, the fact that God doesn't count our debt anymore, he dismisses our debt, when we get to that point, that's when we can be congratulated and happy and joyful and fulfilled. But before that can happen, we need to even know it, which we're going to look at in verses 3 through 6. But before I get to verses 3 through 6, I just want to say a few things. Um, I want to stop here for a moment. Make sure we don't miss this. This first couple verses, although this is written, this is written to the people of God, I just want to say that if you have never experienced the forgiveness of God in the first place, you've never come to know Jesus, uh, we are told in the New Testament I'm just going to give you some uh, references that you can look up later. I'm not going to look them all up today. But what the Bible tells us is that Jesus brings forgiveness of sin. 
He brings forgiveness of sin. 1 Peter 2, 24 is one place we see this. We see that Jesus dismisses the debt of our transgressions and accounts righteousness instead in Romans 5, verses 14 through 16. Finally, uh, we see that Jesus covers our iniquity in Hebrews 8, 12. We see all of these different words for sin are used even in the New Testament or the understanding of these words to show us that Jesus, that ultimate forgiveness comes through Jesus, not just because he came, And not just because he was a random guy that lived on the earth, but Jesus came to live the perfect life that none of you and I, no one could live because we're all crooked, we're all rebels, we're all uh, missing the mark daily. And Jesus came and he didn't rebel against God. He he didn't fail in the purpose that he had. And he wasn't crooked. He was straight. Uh, He was. And when we see this with him, we understand that he is the only one then that could give real forgiveness and to take the punishment to dismiss our debt. That's exactly what Jesus did when he paid the debt for us on the cross, gave his life. He lived that perfect life so that he could be at a place where he would give his life on the cross to die for us, to pay the debt of our sin. When he says on the cross, it is finished. That word means the debt is paid. It is fulfilled. The, the, the debt is gone. That's what Jesus did as he died. And then he rose again to show that all of that, his, the forgiveness that he said he offered was legitimate because he is God and he has the power to forgive sin. He taught that in his life and he showed that through his resurrection. And so if we want to experience true forgiveness from God, it starts with knowing Jesus. So I don't know everybody's heart here. I don't know everybody's heart who might be watching. But if you don't have a relationship with Jesus and you haven't come to him in faith and turned away from your way of living to, to follow Jesus and to believe that he died and rose again so that you could be forgiven, so that you could be uh, covered, so that you your, your sin would be dismissed, your debt would be dismissed, and you can have real forgiveness and experience blessedness or happiness, joyfulness, and that goes deeper than just what the world says happy is about. It goes so much deeper than that. But if you don't know Jesus, I just want to start just by saying that right now. Before we even get to the rest of this passage, Jesus is the one who brings forgiveness. Now, when the psalm is written, this is looking forward. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's talking about the here and now, that David was forgiven. But it's also a picture, again, as all of the Old Testament is, pointing towards Jesus. That our iniquity, our transgression, and our sin would all be paid for by Jesus. And that's the gospel. And if you haven't received the gospel, if you need to know more, please talk to me, Pastor Justin, any one of our elders, anyone you know that might know Jesus. But the gospel doesn't just end at salvation. So that's the gospel message. The gospel doesn't just end there. The truth that God forgives our sin continues on even for us who aren't, uh, who already are believers. All right. So I don't want us to think that this psalm is all about, oh, this is just a psalm for those who uh, aren't, that don't know Jesus. All those who haven't already experienced forgiveness. I believe that the forgiveness uh, and the covering and the uncounted iniquity, all of this stuff that David is talking about, I, we still struggle with sin in this world. Even though we know Jesus, we are not perfect. We all still struggle with rebellion. We all still struggle with missing the mark. We all still struggle at times with our way being crooked a little bit. And we need God's forgiveness not only one time, although that does cover us and it gives us everything that we need for to live with God forever and have eternal life with him through his forgiveness. It's not like we lose that forgiveness the next day because we sin again. But it is important as we look at this passage that we continually make sure that we deal with our sin. And I would say this, if you really know Jesus, then you will deal with your sin on a continual basis. But what is the process of receiving the forgiveness or the blessedness? Well, blessedness comes through misery. That sounds fun. Uh, Verses 3 and 4. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away uh, through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Uh, David is talking about how he felt when he had unconfessed sin. Notice this, for when I kept silent, my bones wasted away. So he's talking about unconfessed sin. He's talking about that time that he's covering up his sin. Maybe this was the sin with Bathsheba. Maybe this was just sin in general. But he's covering up his sin. And when he doesn't, when he's keeping silent, when he's not confessing, when he's covering up his own sin, which he'll even say later on in verse 5, he says, I acknowledge my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. The understanding there is that he was covering his iniquity. He was covering it up. He was lying to himself, lying to others, lying to God. And in that time, 
uh, he was feeling miserable. <laughs> Notice here how he feels. And is this all physical, necessarily this is exactly what's happening? Was he really groaning all day long? Were his bones really withering? It's, it's poetry. Probably these are just ways that he's expressing how he feels. But the obvious part here is he would feel what many of us might even call depression. He's being weighed down. He's being weighed down. And the interesting thing is it says, for day and night your hand is heavy upon me. Why is David feeling weighed down? It's because God has his hand on him. It kind of reminds me if uh, you have kids and like they're doing something that they're not supposed to do, but you're kind of in public and you're like, I can't really like, Spank them. I can't really yell because people are going to think I'm a bad parent. So I don't know what to do here. So you just come over and you just put their, you put your hand on their shoulder and you just press down a little bit, you know, and just squeeze a little bit. Like that's uncomfortable for them. And what the point of that is, is you're uncomfortable. That means you need to change, right? So I almost get a feeling and I don't have, I, I haven't looked in the Hebrew on this is this is what is really trying to, so you can talk to Justin about that later. But uh, I just have this idea. This is what I see when I read this. Like I just see God putting his hand on my shoulders. Like, pushing down and giving a little bit of pressure, saying, hey, buddy, you need to deal with this. You know, you need to change. And I get this feeling, and God is involved here, and I think that's the important thing we see here, that this isn't just he's just feeling bad because he's doing bad things. Even people who don't know God feel bad when they do bad things sometimes. But this is beyond that. This is God is putting pressure on him, and he's feeling it. He's feeling it to the point where he's saying he's groaning and he's wasting away. Uh, His strength was dried up, like, uh, today was a hot day, right? Uh, the last few weeks have been a hot day. If we were to stand outside and do a service for six hours, at the end of that time, you'd be dried up. You would just be barely able to move. And that's how David is explaining this, how he feels. And so the first pro- part of the process is to feel miserable sometimes. And I'm going to say this. Um, we shouldn't stay there, okay? I want to make sure this is clear. Um, when I say that we need to handle our sin appropriately, I want to make sure that we're not looking at this in a way of saying, well, I just, oh, I feel bad about my sin. Oh, well, okay, what I just read means that's good for me to feel that way all the time. I am not saying to sit in your misery. I am not saying to feel awful all the time or to, uh, to loathe yourself, to say that you are no good and nobody's good enough and I'm not good enough for anybody and all this. Living in misery is not the point here because we see that that changes in verse 5. So we want to get to a change, but there are times in our life where we'll, we will feel miserable when we're in sin, specifically covered or hidden sin. And many of us, that's the sin that we really face. That's that sin we struggle all the time and that people might not know about, but it's there. And we want to hide it and, and we want to make sure that it's covered up. And when we do that, it can eat us up. It should eat us up. I'm going to say, this is a bold statement, I understand this. A lot of times, maybe we've seared our conscience, which I believe happens a lot. But if you are willfully committing a hidden sin and you feel nothing, you really need to take the time to examine your relationship with Jesus. Really take the time to realize, do you, or to think, do you really know Jesus the way that you say you do? Because I believe that when we are in sin, we will feel this. That doesn't mean we're a bad person, but it means... Well, we are bad people. That is what it means. But it doesn't mean that, that, that this is a wrong thing to feel. When we feel that way, we need to... We, and sometimes, by the way, we might feel this way, and it might not be because of sin. I'm not saying every time that you feel down, that means you're, you're an awful, rotten sinner that needs to repent. I'm just saying you need to make sure that that might not be it. I believe that as, if we want to be a blessed person, uh, we will look at misery in our lives and just take a look and see, is this because of sin? And if it is, then we get to verse 5. Confession. Verse 5. I acknowledged my sin to you and I did not cover my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Verse 5 is the next part of the process. It's confession. We feel miserable, so what should that lead us to do? This is the point. Not to stay in our misery, because that's just self-loathing. That's not going to help anybody. But instead to stay in our misery, we confess our sin, our transgression to God. And we admit that. This is confession is to tell the truth. It's to uh, reveal. It's to uh, confess and to admit. It's all those words. And, and it's to say, yes, I am these things. I am a rebel. I am uh, missing the mark. I am crooked. And we say these things. And David acknowledged my sin to you. He says, and I did not cover my iniquity. I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. 
notice what we see here. All three words for sin are used again. That number three comes back. And he's saying, the wholeness of my sin, I confess the wholeness of my sin. This is not just talking about a my specific thing that I did wrong yesterday, although that's something we should confess too, but it's the completeness of our sin. I have confessed this to you. I have admitted this to you. And, and the understanding here is when he says, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin, is that we ask for forgiveness. It's one thing to admit that you're a sinner. It's another thing to ask for forgiveness for that sin. I've met people before that are in the middle of sin, are doing something they know they shouldn't do, but they say, eh, you know, I don't really care. Again, that goes back to the misery part. If you don't really care, and God is not putting his hands on your shoulders and pushing you down, then you need to consider what your relationship with God really looks like. I'll just leave that there. So confession, by the way, this goes back to verse 2. Uh, Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. We skipped over this phrase, but we were coming back to it. It says, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Going back to the cover-up idea, and now we get to confession, and David says, I did not cover my iniquity. The understanding here is that we lie to ourselves when we cover up our sin. We lie to ourselves, we lie to others, we lie to God. We are deceitful in the way we live when we cover up our sin. But when we confess our sin, then there is no deceit, and that's part of the blessedness, because we're not hiding anything. If you guys have lived a life where you've hidden something from somebody, you know that that creates a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress. And when you release that, when you say that, when you, when you say what you need to say, then that stress and that anxiety and that heaviness will go away. And the same is true with God. And so we don't want to lie about what we're doing. First uh, John 1, 8, 9, you guys all know this passage. Many of you have it memorized. I want to read this to you because the, the New Testament talks about this clearly. First John. In First uh, John, again, we are going to look at chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. It says this, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Pretty strong words by John here in First John. And he talks about how the forgiveness that we experience, first of all, is through the blood of Jesus in, in verse 7. But then he says, if we say we haven't sinned, we're deceiving ourselves, first of all. And then he says later, if we say we haven't sinned, we make him a liar. We're making God a liar because God has said we are all sinners. We're all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Uh, uh, you know, we see that throughout Scripture. We are all rebellious. We are all failures. And we are all crooked in the way we live. And this is all true. And what John says in 1 John is you need to confess this and then God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from unrighteousness. Here's the next point that I want to make when we talk about confession. To confess is to uncover our iniquity. It's to unhide it. That's to say, here it is, and it's to deal with it. It's to confess to the point where we deal with it and we ask for forgiveness. Now, I want to be very clear here. Confession doesn't bring forgiveness. What do I mean? What brings forgiveness? God gives forgiveness. Don't miss this. Just because you confess your sin doesn't mean that you're automatically forgiven. Yep, I sinned. Okay, that's good. I'm done. No. The point is, God is the one who is the forgiver. And so we run to him, we confess to him, and we ask him for forgiveness. We need to uncover our sin so that God can cover it. Remember, we talked about that covered sin earlier on. If we want God to cover it and to hide it, then we need to not hide it ourselves. So again, going back to the main point, let us not cover our sin, but let God cover our sin. This is how the, the path to blessedness. I don't know if there's a hidden sin in your life right now. I think a lot of us have one. But again, it's time to confess. Confess it to yourself. Confess it to God. Confess it to others. It'll lead to a blessed life. Finally, verse 6, uh, what happens uh, in the process? So he feels miserable. He confesses his sin. Verse 6, first part, Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when he may be found. Prayer. Prayer becomes part of the process as we are miserable. We confess our sin and we pray to God. It's the understanding of bringing our sin to God, but it's also the understanding communicating with somebody means that you have a relationship with somebody. So this communication is the sign of a restored relationship. 
You see, when he was keeping silent earlier in in verse 3, now he's praying to God. And he says, all of us, all the godly, all the people of the covenant, all of us should pray towards God and pray for deliverance from sin, but deliverance from the effects of sin as well, which we'll look at in just a moment. I'm not going to dwell there too much longer except to say that when we pray, we see our relationship with God that's been broken by our transgression has been repaired. But what is the product of forgiveness the product of blessedness here. We are blessed if we are forgiven. So what are the things that happen? Well, the first thing is deliverance. Verse 6, um, we just read about the prayer part. It says, Surely the, in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. This is a promise that we're given that deliverance will come. When we confess and pray to God, we bring that to God and we say, God, would you deal with my sin? Would you forgive my sin? Would you cover my sin? I no longer am going to cover it up. Then we see that there is deliverance. And David says this so beautifully. He says here as he talks about that they'll be safe from the great waters, um, preserved from trouble, surrounded with shouts of deliverance. But in the middle of this, it says in verse 7, you are a hiding place for me. You are a hiding place for me. God becomes our hiding place when we, for, when we stop hiding our sin. God becomes our hiding place. And I want to say it this way. Instead of hiding from God, we need to hide in him. Don't, fr- don't hide from God, but hide in him. This is the blessed life. That is why we look at this and David says, he's my hiding place. We will put ourselves in him and say, please protect me, guide me, deliver me. I want to put myself hidden in God. Colossians tells us that we are hidden in Christ. It's this idea that we are hidden in him and we're not hiding ourselves. Stop hiding. Let him find you and then hide in him. The next thing in verses 8 and 9 we see that happens as we experience forgiveness is guidance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye on you. Be not like a horse or mule without understanding which must be curbed with bit and bridle or it will not stay near you. All right, there's some question. Who is talking here? It's kind of weird because, uh, you know, there's different pronouns being used here. And now all of a sudden it says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. There's a debate. Right, So some people say this is God speaking directly to David and directly to us. Some people say this is David talking to the people who are reading. Now, this is a masculine, is what we call it, of David. That's what it said right at the top of 32. Uh, the understanding of this could be it's an instruction psalm. It's a psalm written to instruct people and teach people. Maybe not. We're not exactly sure because none of us were there. So this is what we, we think maybe. So maybe this is David's way of teaching the person that is reading or singing this psalm. Or maybe this is God directly speaking to us. But either way, it's in God's word. So what does that mean? It's God's word. So we take it and we understand what's being said here. And it's that we will receive guidance as we experience deliverance, as we experience forgiveness. We need to listen and follow God's ways willingly. I will instruct you, teach you in the way you should go. This is when we're, when we are open to God, when we're not hiding any longer, we have a clear path. That's the point here. A clear path is, is paved, paved for us, and we need to follow that path, and that the counsel will come, whether David's counsel or that God gives him or God's direct counsel. We, we go to the Word to get counsel. We go and understand what God has said so that we know the way we should go. But then he has this statement about the horse or the mule. And, Aren't some of us so often like a dumb piece of livestock, right? So sometimes we just, uh, and, and what the understanding is here uh, is don't be stubborn. That's part of it. But it says don't be a, like a horse or a mule without understanding who must be curbed with a bit and bridle or it will not stay near you. So David says here, uh, or God says here to us, don't be like a dumb animal that needs to be beaten into submission. That's basically what we're getting at here. Like to get an animal to do what you want, you need to, Curb it with a bit and bridle. You need to really kind of, going back to that pressure, right? That pressure. Uh, You really need to exert some pressure on that animal. You need to, I won't say abuse, that's not what I'm looking for, but you have to really be hard on the animal to get it to be trained to do what you want it to do. And what's being said here is don't be like them. Don't have to be forced. Don't be uh, pressed into submission, but instead do it willingly and follow his ways willingly. Because that's the life of a forgiven person. That's the life of a blessed person. 
is that we follow the guidance of God, not uh, begrudgingly, but willingly. That's what we're getting at. So we want to be blessed. Well, you confess your sin, you, you experience your forgiveness, and you walk in the way God says you should go. Pretty simple. Finally, what is the product of uh, blessedness through forgiveness? Well, it's joy, verses 10 and 11. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. All right, so the last product that we see that comes out of forgiveness, blessedness through forgiveness, is joy. First of all, we see that those who stay in their sin are sorrowful, the wicked. Those who stay in their sin, those who don't re- do not confess their sin, those who rebel, those who continue to miss the mark, those who continue to be crooked and don't care, those wicked people who will not fear the Lord, those people will be sorrowful. This is not what we always see in life, right? Sometimes we look at people and they look like they're really, really happy. I think if you press most people, deep down inside, that's not usually the truth. They might be covering things up. They might be hiding things to make themselves feel better. And some of that is even this false idea of happiness. But what the Bible says is that the wicked will be sorrowful. Why is this written here? Well, it's to point to the opposite thing. Because then it says, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Lord, what is the opposite of sorrow? Somebody tell me. Joy. Okay, there we go. You haven't listening. I thought some of you were falling asleep. So, okay. So, uh, joy is the opposite of sorrow. The joy, though, is based on the fact that we are surrounded by the steadfast love of Yahweh, the steadfast love of the Lord. We are surrounded by his love. That brings joy. Not the situations in our lives. That doesn't bring joy. Not when we're successful in the world's eyes. That doesn't bring joy. What brings joy is being surrounded by God's love, no matter what's happening in the world around us. And part of experiencing God's love happens when we do confess our sin and he's given us forgiveness. We understand the steadfast love of God, that he sticks with us and he loves us no matter what. And then verse 11, be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. When's the last time you jumped for joy for something? Um, probably some of you who are Buffalo Bills fans, maybe when we made the playoffs, right? So we may have jumped for joy. I'm sure Mike was. I hope he has a video. But, uh, you know, jump for joy, shout for joy, jump up and shout When's the last time we've shouted for joy? And I don't know what it was for for you, but have we shouted for joy in the forgiveness that we've been given? Here's what I want to talk about. I think a lot of us take forgiveness for granted, right? I know I do. It's like, all right, yeah, I'm forgiven. Great, cool. Thanks, God. You know? But do we really understand what that means? We were completely broken. Completely broken. And and where the times that we tried to turn up the radio, God said, no, I'm going to fix you. And so we're fixed and we're whole and we're how we're supposed to be because he's forgiven us of our sin. And again, going back to Romans 5, not only has he forgiven us of our sin, but he's replaced that with uh, the righteousness of Christ, that he looks at us as righteous. And therefore, we can have real gladness and joy. We can shout for joy. We, the upright in heart, those who have experienced forgiveness should be joyful and we should be shouting for joy kind of tempted to just have everybody shout right now, but I won't do that. All right, somebody wants to. All right, if you want to shout for joy, shout for joy. That's right. All right. It's it's silly, but not silly, right? Because, like, this is what David was doing. Are we, do we, do we really understand what God has done? That's my question. I think we take it for granted so often. I want you to think about the relief and the good feelings you have when you have a broken relationship on this earth. Husbands, wives, maybe you have a big fight. You walk away from each other for a while and you feel the anxiety of it. And then you come back together and you you have forgiveness and you have a conversation. And there is a release there. Just think of that feeling and how happy and joyful and blessed that makes you. But even a thousand times more, if not a million times more, that same idea that we have been completely tainted. Our relationship with God has been completely broken. And yet through Jesus, he brought forgiveness for you and for me that we didn't deserve at all. We did nothing to deserve that forgiveness. And he brought it to us through grace and mercy that we had, that we just, that should blow our minds and it should cause us to be joyful, real joy. And yes, times that means we might even shout out with joy. And that's good. 
We need to be joyful as we understand what God has done for us and in us. So, we've looked at blessedness comes through forgiveness. That we don't cover up our sin, but let God cover it. He forgives our transgressions. He covers our sin. He doesn't count our iniquity. Uh, we see that that is ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. The blessedness comes sometimes that God will put misery on us to make us get to the point where we need to confess. And then we confess. And through his mercy and his grace, he forgives us as we open up our lives to him. And we pray and restore that relationship. And then we thank him for his deliverance and his guidance. And we have joy in our lives because he has given us everything we could ever want and so much more. And we have joy not just in our forgiveness. It's not just about, oh, good, I'm off the hook. It's joy in him. It's joy in the Lord. It's joy saying, God, you are so good and so great and I am nothing and yet you forgave me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That is who we thank. We don't We don't just feel, oh, good, I don't have to experience my sin any longer. That's part of it, but it's even bigger than that. It's that God has forgiven us. So a couple of questions in conclusion. And uh, I have some verses I wanted to get to. So again, I'm going to give you the verse. Write it down if you're taking notes. You don't have time to read all of them. But first question, have you received the forgiveness that Jesus offers through the gospel? I already explained the gospel. Uh, there's more to it than just what I said. I'm very short. But if you want to know more about what it means to know Jesus, if you're here, talk to one of us. If you're online, send an email or give us a call. We'd love to talk to you about how you can know Jesus as your Savior. Uh, Romans 4, 1 through 8, I, like I said, I won't read this. It's interesting. Paul quotes this psalm in Romans chapter 4, 1 through 8. And in that, in Romans 4, 1 through 8, what Paul is saying is it's not our works that save us, but it's our faith. It's believing in Jesus. It's believing in God's promises. It is not about what we do. And he uses this psalm to remind everyone that it's God who forgives. We can't earn forgiveness. So that's Romans 4, 1 through 8, if you want to read that. Uh, the next question for all of us is, do you take sin seriously? Do I take sin, sin seriously? Do you need to confess your sin to God and to others? Hebrews 3, 12 through 14 says that we need to be watching out for one another. Or First of all, we need to be watching out that we are not hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And we also need to be watching out for one another that we are not hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. James five sixteen says, confess your sins to one, one to another. So do you take sin seriously? Do you really realize that the sin that is overcoming you, the rebellion, the missing the mark, the crookedness that you are experiencing in your life right now, if you are, that that should drive you to confession. It should drive you to confession to God, to yourself, and to others. If you want to see blessedness, if you want to have true joy, it's going to come as you just bear your soul to others, bear your soul primarily to God, and say, here I, here I am, it's open, it's not hidden any longer. God, would you cover my sin? But I think a lot of us just ignore sin, justify sin, or deflect sin on others, and we think that somehow we are immune to needing this forgiveness that has been talked about today. There is no sin that God can't forgive. David's sin was complete, but God's forgiveness is complete. Your sin might be complete, but God's forgiveness is so much more. It's complete as well. So I don't know what it is for you. I could list a whole list of secret sins that might be in your life. That's for the Holy Spirit and you to figure out. But whatever that is, confess it, repent, move away from it, receive forgiveness, and be blessed. Be blessed. Finally, are you living a life of joy and praise and the blessedness of forgiveness? Philippians 4.4. We all know that verse. If you know it, say it with me. Ready? Philippians 4.4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Are you living a life of real joy? And by the way, people will see that. If you live a life of constant sadness and kind of like uh, you're, you're Eeyore, if you're Eeyore, uh, people see that. Uh, and that's not a great testimony, right? I mean, uh, let's have joy, right? And I'm not saying you have to be bubbly and smiling all the time and like giving everybody thumbs ups all the time and acting like everything's good all the time. But I am saying that when people talk to you, they should see something in you that is different than what the world has. That even when the world is going crazy and there's viruses and there's all sorts of just junk happening, that people can look at you and say, listen, that there's something different there because you have a joy that I don't understand. And then we have the great opportunity to say, I'm joyful because Jesus forgave me. Do you want to be forgiven? Let me tell you about him. And you can preach the gospel to them. So, do you live a life of joy?
Do you praise God over the blessedness of forgiveness? These are the things that we should do. What I want to do, and this is the end of it all, I'm going to just read one more verse as a way of benediction, and then I'll pray, and then you can go on about your day. But I would pray and and hope that you would think about all that we've talked about, that you would take the forgiveness that God has offered and receive it. And once you have received forgiveness, that you give, you are joyful and you give him the honor that is due him and you rejoice in that. Isaiah 55. Going back to the Old Testament, we've been in Psalm, but now we're going over to Isaiah 55. I'm going to read verses 6 through 12. Just read and listen to these words and let them really make a difference in your mind and in your heart. Isaiah 55, 6 through 12. Seek the Lord while he may be found. That sounds familiar to Psalms. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, do not, and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty. It shall accomplish that which I purpose, that which I succeed, it will succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy. And be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing. And all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. The joy and peace that we feel, that we can have, that we can experience. Not even about feeling, just experiencing and knowing. Is something that causes even the mountains and hills to sing. The trees to clap their hands. Now obviously poetry is powerful here. But if the hills and trees are supposed to do that, we should too. When we read this passage about his thoughts are not our thoughts, it is in context talking about forgiveness. God knows, loves, cares, and forgives. Would you go out in joy? Verse 12, for you shall go out in joy. Would we go out from joy today as we leave here? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the reminder of your goodness, your love, your forgiveness. Help us to have joy in that. Help us to confess anything that we're holding back, Lord, that we're hiding, that we're covering up. Lord, help us not to cover that, but we want you to cover that for us. God, help us not to hide from you, but to hide in you. I pray that we would do that, each and every one of us, that we would put every care and concern and problem that we face in you and just come to you and let you envelop us in your arms. God, help us to hide in you and not hide from you. Help us to deal with our sin appropriately, not to live in depression over our sin, but to bring it to you and open up our lives to you and to others and to ourselves so that we can experience true blessedness and true forgiveness. God, we thank you for the forgiveness. We thank you that you've covered our sin. We thank you that you paid our debt through Jesus. Help us not to forget that. Help us not to take that for granted. And help us leave here, as we're told in the book of Isaiah, that we will go out in joy. Help us to do that today. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.